So my name is uh, Thomas R. Porsche. I've started 17 companies. I've had seven unicorns. This is a company that is similar to one of my previous unicorns. Um, thank you. I started a company called SciTech where we automated cytology labs. Cytology labs read pap smears. And we completely changed the direction of cervical cancer. Cytology labs were completely unautomated. And um, I could have looked at what other labs are unautomated, but I looked at what other cancer diagnostic tests were in need. And I started a, a company called Exact Sciences, which has a replacement for colonoscopy. But after um, a few years, I ended up reading some articles about um, drug discovery and cell culture. And I discovered that Next slide. Yeah. So I discovered that the things that you see here, which are screens from our instruments, are things that you would not usually see together, which are pictures of cells and data. We found this area, which is cell culture, which is really neglected, yet it is the basis for almost all drug discovery. And what I read about was what's called the reproducibility crisis. And what that is, is that very few of the research, very small amount of research that is, that is done can be reproduced by another lab. And if it cannot be reproduced by another lab, it's not science. So Nature Magazine did a survey of 1,500 scientists. And they basically said that this is a crisis. More than 52% said, that this is a crisis. Imagine a field where over half are telling you that the results are not valid. In 2014, I read an extraordinary study done by Amgen. They studied 53 landmark oncology studies, and they were only able to reproduce six of them. And this has been confirmed by many. We spend $52 billion a year in the United States in preclinical research, and over half of that is junk. It's not reproducible. So this is a, a, a problem that I wanted to fix. It's one of the main problems in drug discovery, which uh, you have better odds in Las Vegas than you do with drug discovery. Next slide, please. So, so I went and looked at a cell culture lab again, having not been at one for 20 years, and sadly, it really had not changed. Cell culture labs, you keep these plates of cells in an incubator, you take them out, put them under a microscope. Researchers spend a couple of hours a day looking at cells, millions of cells through the microscope, and they put it back into the incubator. And guess what? There's almost no data that's retained, maybe some scribblings in a lab notebook that can't be found. Uber knows more about us than we know about the cells that we're studying for medicine. So the result is you have extraordinary rates of mislabeling, depending on the survey, 11% to 30%. So this means that a researcher is studying liver cancer, thinks he's studying liver cells, but 11% to 30% of the time, it's from a different organ. There's also, because of the stress, tremendous amount of genomic drift. So, it really is been, has been 70 years. This is a picture from Tuskegee Institute of the first cell culture factory, and it is exactly 70 years ago. And things have really not changed since then. Things are still manual. There's very little data. It's not scalable. There's almost no analytics. And that is the set of problems that we are going to solve. So just um, a little bit of background on Thrive. So our products are not FDA regulated, um, which means that we don't have that kind of binary risk that you often see. It is a huge market. Our instruments are used in all fields within life sciences. We have sold 29 units. We're projecting $4.4 million this year. We've booked in this quarter uh, 1.1 million. And I expect to grow this company in five years to be a $250 million company. And I've done that before. 
It's a very large market. We have proprietary instruments. We have a family of instruments. We have some significant collaborations with uh, large pharma in Japan, Harvard Stem Cell Institute, the Broad Institute, really major research centers. And we've raised um, $32 million to date, going on 33. We have three offerings that um, are coming up. We're currently closing out a convertible note, a discounted convertible note that will convert into the Series B. And we've done about 7 million of that. We'll do another million or two this month. We are acquiring a company in the cell culture space, which is the leader in environmental controls. And so we're raising some debt with warrants for that. And then mid-year, we expect to do our Series B, which should be the only round that we do. So this is our set of products. And we're not a one product company. We have a, a bench top imager which um, sits in the lab and uh, cell culture plates are put in and it captures gigabytes of data in minutes. This has never been available before in live cell biology. My co-founder developed uh, most of the sequencers that are, are on the market, including those made by Illumina. And he's basically puts it this way, that we're doing for cell biology what sequencing did for genomics and it completely revolutionized the field. And we plan to do the same. This data has just not been available in something as important as live cells. We're currently at the 10 engineers, nine and a half software and are working on software modules, just delivered our first one. They are to help us expand the market and make it easier for researchers in, in important workflows. And ultimately within a few years, we're gonna automate the whole process of cell culture and we have alpha versions. So one of our customers, uh, uh, chairman of the biochemistry department at a major medical school in the United States, described the problems that we have in the current industry, which is that the current tools for imaging, they hurt the cells, they only give two dimensional images, they give it at one single point in time, they don't capture enough data. And he actually said, after using our instruments on infectious disease research, uh, COVID-19 vaccine for Pfizer, Thrive will change the world. Thrive allows us to understand and see living dynamic cells and tissues in 3D over time with extraordinary images, with remarkable images. So in order to solve the problem of better live cell imaging and live cell-based experiments, it's not just taking a microscope and making it better. <clears throat> it's solving all the problems around it, which is a lot of what we do. You have to control the environment. Remember I mentioned that these cell culture plates are taken across multiple environments. You have to be able to document. This is one of the most critical things that can be done in cell culture labs and is currently in 95% of the time, cell culture labs record everything in lab notebooks. It has the least penetration from laboratory information management systems, yet this is the basis for drug discovery. You basically have to have great imaging. Um, you have to have it automated, so it's done the same way every time. One of the biggest problems that exists right now in cell biology is that one's images are not comparable to one's own images actually the next day or to another lab, so that researchers are not looking at the same thing each time. And we provide things like databases that just haven't been available. Um, most of our customers have, um, by this point on average, about 20 terabytes of data. They're generating each time they scan 10 or so gigabytes of data. So I mentioned we need good images, and that's kind of our uh, secret sauce. What's different about us from other microscopes is we'll take 100 plus focal planes, so that we have a, basically a posi 3D image. NASA just purchased an instrument for use in the International Space Station. When you think about it, cells are floating in space. How do you image them? And we're the only instrument that can. And for them, the instrument will take 200 focal planes. We take huge images, five megapixels. We take them very fast. And we're able to do something that was a, a gold ring titanium room, which is to follow a single cell. We're able to follow a single cell over time, so we can basically follow the biology. 
So to be able to take these kinds of images, follow them over time in 3D, means you can image things like organoids, um, tissues. These, this is actually the fastest growing area of cell culture because studying drugs in a tissue or in an organoid is, gets you much more information than just a flat layer of cells at the bottom of a plate. Great, thanks. So we have minimal competition. It's basically, but there's always competition. I hate it when somebody says they don't have any. Um, it's, it's the microscope, um, which um, basically individuals take uh, occasional shots of what they think is important. So it's very biased data. No one is collecting the kind of data sets that we are and fits so well into the workflow. Or you could have answered that. It works sometimes. So we have an enormous IP portfolio. Um, I do envision that, that the company will be sold at some point, and this is an important addition of value. We have um, 86 patent applications, about 25 of them have issue, and they cover hardware, software, analytics, blockchain, internet of things, um, stem cell growth, uh, sharing of data among incubators. Next slide, please. So here are some examples of images of where we focus our, our efforts. We image organoids. We are able to compare um, data on multiple drugs. Uh, we're used in COVID-19 research for the first time. Researchers are able to see the development of a viral plaque, which is one of the most important things in infectious disease currently. They stain, and that's the only way they can see it. And they only see it at one point in time. With our instrument, they're actually able to follow it over time. We're able to image cells in suspension, which is important for things um, such as um, in immunology. Um, we are able to count cells, in, even though there are many different kinds of cells. These are all things that our customers tell us have not been done before. Next slide. Next slide. So this is a, a blow up of what you just saw. So this is something uh, really extraordinary. Um, this is basically comparing 24 wound healing drugs. And for the first time it's done with metrics, which is what we produce. We're basically trying to turn cell culture and cell based experiments from kind of a craft into a science. And so these graphs show the wound healing drugs effect on a scratch. This is a, a, a standard kind of assay. And never before has a lab been able to compare with these kinds of metrics, 24 different drugs. Next slide, please. Here's another example. Remember I told you that 11 to 30% of all cells are mislabeled? Well, one of our customers, a, a well-known institute, thought that they didn't have any mislabeled cells, but they saw this data and they noticed that there were some outliers in the rate of growth of their cells. And sure enough, they went back and found that yes, they too, even though they were a big name institute, had mislabeled cells. So having data is very powerful in helping reproducibility. Next slide, please. We have something very basic, barcode documentation system, timestamp. Believe it or not, they get oohs and ahs in cell culture labs. It's a very low bar. There's almost no technology. They basically buy microscopes. Some are quite uh, sophisticated, um, but most labs don't. Um, they don't have the kind of tools that, that other industries have. And just from the barcoding log, which can track where a cell culture plate has been and what reagents have been added to it, um, we hear this often, that basically it saves money and time um, and increases reproducibility. Next slide, please. About five minutes. Okay. So um, I mentioned my co-founder who um, for 25 years was in a genomics field. Um, that's part of the reason that we're able to handle terabytes of data. Um, most cell biologists are not very good engineers. And so we have to make ease of use a really important uh, feature of our instruments. They don't even know that they're generating uh, terabytes of data. On our board, we have uh, Brock Reed, who was the, until just recently, he's, uh, when he started a venture fund, 
Um, since 2006, he was executive director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, which is one of the most important um, applications of our instrument. <laughs> Next slide, please. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, we expect to be a $250 million uh, company in um, between five and, and, and six years. This market is enormous. It is um, mostly 80% pharma and biotech and contract research organizations. There's also quite a big industrial component, such as in cosmetics. Um, actually, Estee Lauder family is our largest uh, family shareholder. They've invested in two of my previous companies, both um, multi-billion dollar exits. And what they saw in this was essentially that we were bringing data to a field that didn't have data. Yes, there are actually parts of the world and of uh, science that have not yet been digitized. Next slide. So we expect an exit um, will occur in maybe two to five years. It's very hard to predict. But what's important is that we fit well into 20, 25 companies. We fit well into any of the microscope companies, um, into the life science instrument companies, um, the imaging companies. So companies like Thermo Fisher, Agilent, TCAN, Perkin Elmer, most all of them, if you listen to their, their annual meetings, focus on live cell imaging and live cell experiments as one of, and, and creation of, uh, of metrics as one of the most important areas in the field. Next slide. So basically, in summary, we're trying to transform this field um, and we're doing it without products that require FDA approval, without products that require discoveries. They, yes, they're patentable. Um, we have a great record in patents, but they're not discoveries. We're cleverly putting together existing technologies to a field that just hasn't had those kinds of tools has really been neglected. So we're basically providing data where data has never been available before. And we make it easy. We make anyone who has our instrument more competitive and research is actually incredibly competitive. And we get a lot of comments from our customers. I can tell you how great it is, but we hear things like remarkable resolution, game changing. This is what cell culture should look like. Thank you very much. I'd love to take some questions. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so I've been practicing that for about 25 years and worked with family offices. You have a huge portfolio and they considered raising money using the IP as financing. We have several deals going on, two $20 million deals, one $250 million deal. And, you know, it's very expensive, but uh, it's good for a company to look for egg that's three, four, five years down where they pay. Just yeah, we, we met in New York, yeah, right? New York. I think you hosted um, exactly. Ivy Phone in New York um, at your at your law firm. I, I've read about these um, a couple of these transactions. I have not had a chance to look look into them. I would be interested in in talking to you. It is extremely expensive to have the portfolio that we do, right. and so um, I could see using some of that to enhance the portfolio and further. Is it uh, generally non-recourse? Uh, I don't know the answer. Okay, we'll talk. The collateral is the IP. Right, but is it recourse to the company or just to the I, just to the collateral? Just to the collateral. Just to the collateral. You know, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, it's a real important value add when you're negotiating um, being acquired, especially if the acquirer is violating your IP. Uh, we believe most of our competition is, um, in part because it's first to file, and many have all of our competition are really filing at a minimal level. Well, thank you.